Um, I'm going to talk about the implications of an economic approach to ecosystems and biodiversity for business. Um, I have seen the course outline, so I have a, an idea of what the kind of material you've covered up until now, and I'm not going to go over introductory material about what is biodiversity, what's happening to it, what are ecosystem services, how does that relate to biodiversity, what is the economic perspective on all of that, how do we value um, biodiversity and ecosystem services. I'm taking all that as given and focusing just on what does this mean for business and what can business do about it. Um, I have the panda bear up there, and that's the only time you'll see the panda bear, and that's simply because I've just accepted a, a job and I'll be moving to Sydney, Australia, which is a dream come true for me and my wife. Um, and they had nothing to do with this part of TEAB, but since I'm employed by them, as of two days ago, I thought I should put up the, uh, the logo. So what I'm going to talk about today, uh, the first of the three lectures, is why should business care? And then secondly, can we kind of unpack a little bit which businesses should care more or less and why in, in terms of which businesses, which sectors have the greatest impacts on biodiversity. And I put the plus or minus there because those impacts are not always negative. Business can have positive impacts on biodiversity and ecosystems as well as negative impacts. And of course business, many of them also depend on biodiversity and ecosystem services and I'll go into that in a bit more detail. Um, towards the end of the lecture, I'm going to present uh, a case study in a little bit more detail uh, showing uh, some work that was done uh, recently while I was still at IUCN in my previous job um, in partnership with a, uh, one of the world's largest cement companies called Holsom, which is a, a Swiss-based company, although the case study was actually in the United Kingdom. Um, and hopefully we'll have time to discuss all of this. Firstly then, why are companies interested? There are many different reasons, um, and I'm sure you could tell me uh, uh, as well what those, those reasons are, but broadly speaking, I think we can talk about um, internal reasons, internal to a business, and uh, external pressures of various kinds. Now, internal bu uh, business drivers, I've included consumer preference because uh, businesses are, are very focused on meeting the demands of their customers. Um, but also we need to think about the awareness or the concern of the managers of a business themselves because they're uh, part of this story and they're uh, reading the, uh, the press and other media just as the rest of us are. So they know increasingly what's going on. They're concerned about it. They're also very focused on what their customers want, which may or may not have something to do with the environment. And they're also concerned with what their investors want, particularly publicly listed companies. Um, whose shares are sold in the market, they need to pay close attention to what uh, shareholders are saying. In terms of external pressures, um, there's general public concern about the environment, um, increasingly stringent uh, product standards, as well as uh, regulatory requirements. So I'm distinguishing here between voluntary standards and legal requirements. And more and more governments are looking to business for answers to the biodiversity uh, crisis. Looking a little bit more closely at uh, what's going on within uh, business management and as part of the TEAB study, about a year and two months ago, um, we had the great good fortune to have McKinsey come to us and say, could we do a survey as a contribution to TEAB um, and use their uh, contacts in the business world, about uh, 1,500 senior executives from around the world, to try and understand what are business attitudes towards, uh, what are managers' attitudes towards biodiversity and ecosystems. And we had to spend a lot of time trying to translate the, the language of biodiversity and ecosystems into something that would be meaningful to these executives. Hopefully we did that, so the part of the survey was defining our terms. And this is just one example from the results suggesting that the, the leading reason that these executives identified biodiversity as a possible concern to their business was reputation. They want to ensure that they are seen as good corporate citizens, um, and that they are not seen as the bad guys. Um, now the question is how important is that really and what are they doing about it? That's another question, but certainly reputation was top of the list of uh, 
the reasons that the, the executives identified for why they should care. But the, the next two down are also interesting. One is the uh, alignment with the company's business goals, mission, or values. And there again, I think we tend to forget sometimes that uh, people in business are us, often. Uh, they're the same, they're part of society. They want um, their companies to be doing the right thing. They want their business to be contributing to their, um, their personal goals. They want some alignment or consistency between what their business is doing and what they, uh, they believe in. And I, I think we shouldn't discount that as a, as a real driver of, of change. And thirdly, um, not surprisingly, responding to regulatory requirements. Many businesses see uh, increasingly stringent rules and regulations, new laws coming on the books um, related to biodiversity and ecosystems in many different countries, and of course they have to respond to that. So I'll just single out those, those top three. There are many other um, drivers which I've already mentioned. Looking a little bit more closely at the findings from that survey, um, the question arises, which of the following risks related to biodiversity, if any, are likely to become significant risks to your business in the next one to three years? So looking into the future, where do these executives see uh, biodiversity becoming uh, more of an issue to, to their businesses? Um, and interestingly, 39% um, out of those 1,500 said, well, they didn't see biodiversity as an issue at all. Um, they may be right. I hope they're wrong. Um, but uh, I think also interesting, more than half did see that biodiversity was likely to become more of a concern, uh, particularly around improving uh, their operations to reduce impacts, um, changes to their product design or the services that they're providing to reduce impacts. So very much focused on the impact side. Lack of crucial inputs, the whole dependence issue, was really uh, a small share, only 12%. And that came as a surprise to me. It may reflect the nature of the companies that are responding to this survey. Turning to a different survey, this one carried out again for Teeb um, by PricewaterhouseCoopers. And they asked a similar set of questions about a year earlier than McKinsey. And I've singled out this particular um, chart, one of many in, in their report, which looks at regional differences in the level of concern about biodiversity loss to, uh, again, about 1,500 business leaders, different business leaders in this case, maybe some of the same people. And it's striking to me that Latin America and Africa are the highest in terms of the awareness and concern about biodiversity loss. North America, uh, including, of course, the US, was right down there with um, Central and Eastern Europe, which is CEE. Moving on to the consumer side of things. Um, we have many examples around the world in different uh, countries and in different sectors of changes in consumer preference and the fact that people want green goods and services. They want to buy products that uh, uh, make them feel good, that are healthy, that uh, do not damage the environment. And we can see that in the growth of these uh, so-called sustainable segments of many traditional uh, markets, forest products, fisheries products, or, uh, food and uh, other agricultural products. And many of those are backed up by various um, voluntary standards, uh, as you can see from the, the logos. And of course, business response to that. Uh, similarly, on the investor side, we've seen, uh, especially in the US, but also to some extent in, in Europe and other regions, um, more and more um, interest on the part of both retail and institutional investors in so-called ethical investment or socially responsible investment or green investment for people's pension funds or their, uh, their bank accounts or, or the, even their mortgages. Um, and here again, I think we're starting to see business responding to this uh, and to some extent factoring biodiversity and ecosystems into these, the, the factors that they consider. For the most part, I'd have to say that um, socially responsible investment doesn't pay a lot of attention to biodiversity and ecosystems. Where they talk about the environment, it's usually climate change, but I think there's an openness there to consider biodiversity and ecosystems as a factor in um, uh, investment management. This is really Pavan's area more than mine, so he would uh, be able to expand on that. And then looking outside at some other, um, I guess these are related factors, 
Uh, this is from a, a survey of uh, 5,000 consumers in France, Germany, the United Kingdom, the US, and Brazil that was carried out last uh, year, 2010. And this is done every year. It's one of these few surveys that actually shows some time trend. And it's interesting that more and more consumers have heard the term biodiversity. They have an idea what that might mean. And in this particular survey, they asked people to define biodiversity. And some people came back and said, um, oh yes, we have a, um, we have a, diversity, po a diversity policy in our, our business. We employ people from all backgrounds. So not everybody gets it right, but 60% um, of consumers in Europe and the US had heard of biodiversity and defined it correctly. They understood what it was, that it was associated with ecosystems and the services that they, you get from nature. And many of the respondents also asserted um, and claimed that they would um, uh, change their, their purchasing practices as a result of their understanding of whether a company was uh, behaving in a responsible manner. Whether they do, in fact, that's another question. Um, one would need some follow-up on that. Uh, interestingly, many consumers want independent verification, so they're not satisfied with self-certification by companies. They want third-party uh, independent uh, uh, validation of the claims that companies are making. Um, one thing I haven't put on this slide, uh, but from the same survey, is there's much higher levels of awareness and understanding of what biodiversity is in uh, Brazil than in some of these developed economies. And that's related to the finding of the, the McKinsey um, and the, sorry, the PricewaterhouseCoopers survey. I think there's just been generally more discussion in those countries of what is biodiversity, what's happening to it, uh, and why does that matter. Product standards, I talked a little bit about the increasing con uh, focus or consideration of biodiversity and ecosystem services in a range of different voluntary product standards. These are just a couple of examples from uh, uh, agriculture in the UK um, and from the carbon market, uh, the voluntary carbon market here in the US. Conservation International and others have set up these CCB standards um, that combine not just quality carbon, but also uh, biodiversity performance. And companies now um, respond to that in, the, in their product offerings and try to produce uh, goods and services that, uh, that can demonstrate uh, the, their environmental credentials. I mentioned regulatory reform. More and more governments are looking not just at the standard uh, command and control approaches to uh, environmental management, but also trying to change the incentives to make it more costly to do the wrong thing, more profitable to do the right thing. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that um, in future lectures. Uh, and lastly, I mentioned that um, more and more governments are not just looking to uh, refine the sticks that they use and the incentives that they offer, but also they want to have a, uh, a collaboration with industry around biodiversity. And so you, you see this, for example, um, in the uh, decision of the Convention on Biological Diversity, this international treaty, um, reaching out to the business community. And that's new. The, the treaty's been in place since 1992, but it's only within the last uh, five or six years that they've started to pay attention to the business world, to think about how do we engage uh, the private sector in um, these goals of, of biodiversity conservation. And that's true also at a national level. So having looked a little bit at some of the factors that are driving business interest in biodiversity and ecosystem services, we, we need to start unpacking a little bit and understanding which sectors, which companies have the greatest impacts, positive or negative, or the greatest dependence. And um, apologies for those who may have uh, looked at the slides that I sent yesterday. Um, I modified them slightly. I guess that's my prerogative. Um, on the basis of a, a report that just came out uh, two or three days ago. So I thought it was interesting to have a quick look. What are they saying about the linkages? How do we understand the relationship between uh, different businesses and biodiversity? And I like this particular figure because it shows that uh, it tries to, to boil down a lot of different uh, linkages and relationships uh, all together. Starting at the bottom with the organization, which could be the company, could be a public agency. Um, which both benefits from ecosystem services, both the stocks and the flows, and it's important to recognize those two aspects, um, and also 
creates pressures, impacts on those ecosystems that affect those, those flows. Um, the figure also reflects the fact that pressures on ecosystems come from many different sources, including other stakeholders, and business often asks, well, what am I responsible for versus what other changes may be taking place, including natural causes that may be going on behind the scenes affecting the quality or quantity of ecosystem services. Other stakeholders benefit from those same ecosystems and, and services that the, the business is benefiting from. You put all of that together, the organization or the business has to come up with some responses, uh, taking account of interests of other stakeholders, their benefits, their pressures, natural causes, and so on. So I, I found it, it's, a, it's a slightly complicated figure, but a useful one for showing the different relationships uh, between an organization and ecosystems. Now, that's all very well to have that kind of theoretical understanding. When you look at practice, most companies don't bother, to be quite honest. These are the top 100 companies in the world by market value, and they're uh, reporting. And the extent to which their annual reports or their sustainability reports um, pay attention to biodiversity and ecosystem issues. And you can see on the left in the annual reports um, that something like 2%, two companies out of 100, uh, identify biodiversity as a key strategic issue. So it's still pretty low on the radar screen and, and less than a, a quarter altogether, whereas um, actually less than a fifth uh, of those top 100 companies altogether mention biodiversity uh, at all. When you look at sustainability reports, uh, the same companies again, even there, biodiversity is relatively low. Um, something like uh, just over 40% make no mention of biodiversity in their sustainability reports. They're talking about community, energy efficiency, water use, but not biodiversity or ecosystem services. And one of the reasons for that is they don't know what to report. So in the case of climate change or energy, we have a simple indicator. People can talk about efficiency, they can talk about uh, CO2 equivalent of their emissions or the offsets that they may have uh, delivered. In the case of biodiversity and ecosystems, the, the conservation community is still grappling with how do we measure this? What do we want businesses or anyone else to deliver? Um, and so this is just a selection of some of the indicators that uh, were pulled together um, as scientific input to uh, the uh, the 10th conference of the parties of the Convention on Biological Diversity last year to say this is the state of the world, this is the state of biodiversity today. And there are lots of uh, interesting indicators here, but most of them are not suitable for business. If you have a look, what business needs are indicators they can use at the level of a facility, a site, or a product, or that they can aggregate across many different product lines, many facilities, at, uh, uh, so they have a sort of group-wide indicator. They need to be able to measure not only their, uh, their processes, their production processes, but also their, uh, their performance uh, in sort of hard terms. And they need them both for internal and external reporting. Again, most of the indicators that the conservation community has been looking at for the last 30, 40 years don't lend themselves to uh, business reporting. And so that's, that's a bit of a, a challenge. Nevertheless, some companies are trying to get around this. And here's an example of uh, a brewery, um, SAB Miller, uh, major operations in sub-Saharan Africa and, uh, and other uh, regions. Um, they look at water in particular. You'd expect that from a beer uh, producer. And, and they have targets that they've set um, that they can measure year on year. They compare across their different regional operations how well they're doing on the efficiency of water use and they look at both where they're getting water from and what uh, quality of water they're putting back into the ecosystems. So that's one example. Works fine for a brewery. Um, when you get into other sectors, it's more complicated. This is from R Rico, uh, Rico, I don't know how you say it. It's a Japanese company that makes um, uh, multifunctional digital copiers, what we might call Xerox machines, although that's a trademarked term. Um, so there, this was a report done for them to try and understand what are the links between the electric, electronic copier business and biodiversity. And they, it's a very complicated chart, unfortunately, and I'm not going to try and take you through it, but they had to look at the whole production process, 
looking upstream at raw material supply, looking downstream at the use of the machine and the eventual uh, disposal of the machine, and try to, to identify all the pollutants um, and all the resources that went into this production process uh, to tease out the links with biodiversity. You can imagine trying to turn this kind of chart into a simple report is not going to be straightforward, and every sector is going to have a different uh, chart like that. So it's not easy. Having said that, there are many people trying to simplify reporting requirements and expectations for business. Um, and just a few of them I've mentioned here. You have uh, the Global Reporting Initiative, GRI, which has done a lot of work on um, voluntary reporting for companies and other organizations on social and environmental issues. And they recently came out with some work on ecosystem services, which I'll talk about in a moment. You have the Carbon Disclosure Project, purely voluntary, but driven by the investment community and asking um, asking their investee companies to report on their carbon footprint and their, their actions vis-a-vis -vis climate change. Based on that CDP, you also have the Water Footprint Disclosure Project and the Forest Footprint Disclosure Project. Um, and some people have talked about a Natural Capital uh, Footprint Disclosure Project. There are lots of these, these schemes coming up to try and uh, help businesses identify appropriate indicators uh, to assess their environmental performance. Um, some of that work, which is mostly multi-stakeholder uh, initiatives, purely voluntary, is being now taken up by more formal uh, regulatory bodies. So uh, in the UK, the um, Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales got together with the Environment Agency, a government um, department, to issue uh, guidelines on reporting on environmental issues. And these are not quite hard law, they're sort of like soft law. But um, in the United States, then, you have the Securities and Exchange Commission, again, coming out with uh, e even more mandatory requirements on how to deal with climate liabilities and, and assets. So based on that kind of experience, you can see improvements in reporting happening in the voluntary sector and then gradually moving into the regulatory environment. And we can expect this to happen probably with biodiversity and ecosystem services, notwithstanding the challenge of what indicators to use. So I mentioned this report that came out a few days ago. Um, they're looking at these ecosystem services in particular, trying to come up with indicators. You can see it's still a work in progress. Um, I particularly like, for genetic resources, the percent of DNA diversity. Um, I don't know anybody who has a database on this or how they're going to, uh, to get a handle on it, but it's nice that they're, they're starting to think about uh, what that might mean. Now, obviously, in economics, we want to get away from physical indicators or qualitative indicators, and we'd like to somehow find a way to integrate information about biodiversity and ecosystem services with financial information about company performance so that we're not just always looking, oh, there's the real annual report, oh, and then there's this kind of fuzzy, warm sustainability report that the financial director never looks at. You want one, one report on corporate performance where these environmental factors, impacts, and dependence are reflected in financial terms. And you've already heard all about the valuation methods. Fortunately, I don't need to go into this because they're um, complicated and uh, a bit tedious. Uh, great fun to do if you ever have the opportunity, so I encourage you, but uh, you know all about the different valuation methods. What's interesting to me is that businesses started to notice also. So for a long time, these valuation methods were used only in the public sector or by academics. You know, you can go get a degree in environmental economics, they'll teach you how to do a contingent valuation or a travel cost model, and then you can get a job at the US EPA or the equivalent in other countries. Um, but until recently, business wasn't interested. They didn't even know. So a couple of years ago, um, uh, when, again, when I was working at IUCN, we uh, got together with something called the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. That's this logo here, which is like a 200-member um, network of um, the biggest companies in the world. 
and they found some volunteers among their members, and you have the, the logos there, who are willing to see whether valuation of ecosystem services could be adapted to their business needs. Could we use those complicated methods in a business context to do a variety of things? And as it says there, to try and reduce costs, maybe um, operating costs or taxes and other fees, try and generate additional revenue, or to assess liability and, and compensation requirements. And I'll come back to an application in a moment. OK, taking those valuation methods and applying it to business, there have been some very preliminary attempts. And I think this is a slide that you may have seen during the shopping week. Is that right, Pavan? Uh, this was a study carried out by True Cost. It's a UK-based consulting firm. Um, on behalf of the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment, uh, focused on the financial services industry. And what they did is they essentially took a giant input-output database of, uh, that links levels of output in different sectors to levels of resource use or pollution in those same sectors. The data, I think, originally comes from the US EPA, mainly but they've supplemented that with some other uh, countries as well. Um, and what they then did is simply say, OK, given the structure of uh, the economy and the levels of output in these different sectors, what can we say about the use of resources and the pollution from those companies? And they looked at 3,000 companies listed on stock exchanges around the world. And then let's put prices on them. And they used those valuation techniques with a lot of heroic benefits transfer, and I guess you've heard about benefits transfer, to try and assign values to those pollutants and the use of resources. And this is what they came up with, and I guess uh, Pavan may have gone into this a little bit, but essentially, because the data that's available is very heavily weighted towards greenhouse gases, the green portions of the bars are basically the bulk of the problem um, in their analysis, and those are greenhouse gas emissions. Those are the value of greenhouse gas emissions using, I believe, the social accounting price for carbon, not the market price. Um, I assume you've discussed the difference between the social price of carbon and the market price of carbon? Yes, thank you. Um, food producers, as you would expect, uh, come out heavily uh, weighted by water use. No surprise there. What strikes me, however, is that, again, biodiversity and e most other ecosystem services related to biodiversity don't figure here. And that's just a, it's a reflection of the data that is available. If you look at US EPA's input-output data, they don't tell you about use of ecosystem services or impacts on biodiversity. So, and even if they did, we don't have prices for most of those ecosystem services, so it would be very difficult to construct a, a table like this. Um, that's an area that still needs work. Here's an example, not at a global level, but at a country level and a sector. This is forestry in China. Pavan, you didn't use this one, I don't think. No, OK. So here, they, uh, the analysts, again, true cost, and this was done on behalf of TEEB, um, tried to look at a broader range of ecosystem services related to deforestation and to link that to logging and um, the use of timber in the Chinese economy during the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s. Um, and they came up with an estimate of the loss of ecosystem services resulting from deforestation that could be attributed to um, the production of timber for the materials and construction industry in China. And then they said, OK, let's add up those environmental costs and compare it to the market price. And you can see in the chart on the left that the environmental costs are greater than the, the market price of timber in Beijing in 1998, uh, which is interesting um, partly because the market price uh, in 1998 did not reflect any of those ecosystem impacts. So that market price, the, the green bar, um, that was the cost of you know, accessing the land, extracting the timber, producing it, shipping it to Beijing uh, in some semi-finished uh, form um, in cubic meters, dollars per cubic meter. 
it did not include those environmental impacts. And if it, those environmental impacts had been reflected in the market price of timber, you would imagine a lot of changes in the, uh, the use of timber in China. Now what's interesting also is that um, around about the same time there were some environmental disasters in China, uh, including major flooding, which was attributed to deforestation and thus to logging. And there was a logging ban imposed shortly after uh, 1998, I think in 1998. As a result of which, um, to, you could say that the logging ban took account of these environmental impacts and corrected the market failure. But you could also point to the fact that the consumption of timber in China did not go down. The construction boom continued. It's just they found their timber somewhere else. They imported it. So those environmental costs have been shifted from Chinese forests to other forests. And you'd have to look at, well, where is the construction industry in China now getting its timber from? And are those countries managing their forests in an appropriate way? Do they have policies that reflect these environmental impacts? Unfortunately, in many cases, they don't. So I've talked a lot about business impacts on the environment, and mostly uh, I realize I've talked about negative impacts. I'll get back to positive later on. Um, but I think it's another area that people tend not to talk about enough, in my view, is the dependence of business on biodiversity and ecosystem services. And this is one very obvious example in agriculture, is the role of wild insects um, and other animals in pollination and the value that that delivers to um, agriculture. Now, we know that the value of food includes the value of pollination, because without the pollination, there's no food. But typically, um, in many parts of the world, farmers do not pay for pollination services. Interestingly, in the US, for some crops, they do. For almonds in California, for blueberries, in this case, in Michigan, farmers will pay for pollination services. And we can see from that what's the value to, uh, in terms of the value added of those pollinators to agriculture. In the US, it's very often domesticated bees that are rented for the purpose. People will rent the hive, uh, the bees will come and pollinate the crop, the farmer then pays the owner of the beehives uh, who moves on to the next farm. The problem, as you probably know, is that in uh, North America and some other continents, we have a problem with domesticated bees, uh, namely they're dying, right? So this colony collapse disorder then has generated more interest in how do we maintain populations of wild bees and wild pollination services. Um, and the case study that we, we have in TEEB is from Syngenta, which is an agribusiness company. They produce chemicals and seeds for farming and they realize that the health of their business depends on the health of farmers, and the health of farmers depends on the health of pollinators. And so they've invested with the U.S. Department of Agriculture and others in uh, something called, uh, I think, Operation Pollinator, which is an attempt to try and restore habitat for wild pollinators as a kind of backstop. If we don't find a solution to um, the whatever's affecting domesticated bees, we'll at least have the wild um, pollinators to, to maintain production to some extent. Okay, um, I've talked a lot, probably too much, and I should have said at the outset that I'm very happy for anyone to interrupt me at any time and say we know all that or to ask a question or uh, to disagree or whatever you wish to, to do. Yes. I, I would agree with that. My, my experience of working with some, some big companies is that they're slightly schizophrenic. Just like any big institution, like the US government, you'll find people that hold very different points of view within the same organization. So the people working on health, safety and environment or sustainability, they will have a very different set of priorities, but they don't generally run the show. They don't have as much influence, say, as the financial directors and other chief, uh, other executives. Um, I think the, um, the Global Reporting Initiative is on the right track. This is a very simplistic uh, 
approach, what they've got here, but this is an attempt. Is it, I don't know if this is the answer to your question, but they're trying to boil it down to a few um, products or resources that would be intelligible to most companies, the ones listed on the left there, and then a few simple ways to measure those. Now, I'm not convinced that all of these are going to work. So, for example, look at fiber, um, which would include most forestry, pulp and paper. And they want, they're interested in the volume or weight or the area planted. Well, that's not going to get us very close to biodiversity, is it? I mean, so I think there's still a lot of work to be done. And I'll talk a little bit uh, next week about uh, what's called a habitat hectares approach, which is kind of area with a quality adjustment. Um, you sound like you're from Australia. Okay, well that's where it comes from, as you probably know, the habitat hectares approach. And there are people who've developed similar metrics here in the U.S. related to wetland mitigation banking and cons species conservation banking schemes. It's a similar uh, approach. Um, but there's still a long way to go. There's a lot in that question, because I think what consumers need is different from what the business needs. Business can probably afford to dive deeper, and get more technical, more detail. Consumer just wants something they can quickly eyeball in the supermarket or um, without having to think too much about what's inside that. They're more concerned, perhaps, about credibility. Is it independently verified as opposed to self-certified? Um, I think it's instructive to look at the example of climate change and what happened there. It's simpler because you can take 16 greenhouse gases or however many they took and boil them down to CO2 equivalent. It's fairly straightforward. The chemistry is not complicated. Biodiversity is never going to be that simple. So you're never going to be able to boil it down to one indicator, I don't think. You probably need to look at sector-specific sets of indicators. But what is instructive about the, the greenhouse gas example is at one stage, probably in the mid-90s, um, the World Resources Institute, based in Washington, an NGO, got together with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. I mentioned them before, a big business umbrella group, and came up with a protocol for measuring greenhouse gases in business. And I think you need something like that that has the scientific credibility from the biodiversity crowd, but also the business credibility of an organization like WBCSD to say, this is the protocol, this is how you measure it, um, and this is best practice. It doesn't have to be government that does that, but there has to be buy-in from both the scientific side and the business side. Do you think that buy-in would really provide the information that would be more Yeah, I think that's that. Well, as I said, if, if you don't do that, you end up with these kind of indicators. You know, I've, I've been working in IUCN for nine years with a lot of ecologists and conservation biologists and, and land use management specialists, and they come up with great indicators, but they're at a different level. They're good for sort of landscape level, national level assessment and, and, and uh, planning, but they're not adapted to the needs of, of a, a big business or a little business. Okay, I will move on in that case. I have a, a little case study um, about valuing ecosystem impacts, positive and actually in this case po mostly positive, some negative. Um, and this was a case study carried out as a contribution to that WBCSD guide I mentioned on how to use valuation in, in a corporate context. Um, they had what we called, I'll go back to that briefly, um, they had road testers. So those logos on the bottom are, are companies that volunteered to try out these valuation techniques that you learned about the last few weeks and apply them to their situation. So you've got uh, uh, many different sectors. You've got agribusiness, um, environmental services, for uh, pulp and paper, mining, um, pulp and paper again, cement, two cement companies, um, electronics. ESCOM is a big... Uh, Southern African uh, power producer. They have um, mainly coal-fired power plants, some hydro. Um, ENI is an oil and gas producer. EDP, I forget. Uh, you've got chemicals, ASCO, Nobel, pharmaceuticals, and so on. So you've got a range of different sectors. They all agreed to say, all right, we'll partner up with some valuation specialists, people who know how to value ecosystem services, and see if we can come up with something interesting. And IUCN was part of that. And one of the case studies that we did 
uh, as part of this project was with Holson, big cement company. They have um, in the United Kingdom, in Yorkshire, some quarries from which they extract sand and gravel, big component in concrete, as you know. And they were interested in uh, how to maximize the environmental benefit of the restoration and rehab that they are required by law to do um, as a condition for getting a permit to dig sand and gravel. And so they weren't wondered whether valuation could help them in that uh, planning process of figuring out what is the best restoration and rehabilitation option for them. And they would claim um, at Wholesome that they look at biodiversity throughout the project cycle. And I think it's, it's fair to say that extractive companies, big extractive companies, do have more experience thinking about biodiversity and ecosystems because they have a big footprint on the landscape. Right? They're digging giant holes in the ground and they're under a lot of pressure from stakeholders, NGOs and others, who are saying, hey, you're digging giant holes in the ground, what are you doing about that? And governments have responded and imposed various requirements to restore or rehabilitate um, quarries and, and mining sites. So they do have a, a bit more experience, say, than an, an electronics manufacturing company. Um, and Wholesome, like some others, tries to think about biodiversity at different stages in the project cycle, um, including before the, the decision about whether to go ahead or not with, with a project. Um, I'm not always clear whether, how much weight is given to biodiversity in that go, no go decision, but they would say it's certainly a factor. And of course, most quarries do have a limited life, and so they think about, well, what are they going to do to shut down the project and leave the, the environment in a decent condition, particularly when they're working in highly regulated environments like the UK. Um, now, the starting point for Wholesome, like many companies in this process, was a previous tool um, developed by the World Resources Institute. It's called the Corporate Ecosystem Service Review Tool, or ESR. And it's a kind of qualitative first screening that companies can do to understand what is their relationship to biodiversity and ecosystem services, um, what are the priority impacts or dependencies, um, what are they doing about it, what could they do, more could they do. But then we wanted to go beyond that qualitative assessment and look, in this case, at the economic values at stake. And the decision context here was that the company wanted to expand their quarry. They wanted to, to take more sand and gravel out from this area in, in Yorkshire, um, and they needed a permit to do that. And already under the law in the UK, they have to rehabilitate the, the quarry at the end of its life. And they were proposing a mixture of wetlands and recreational uh, waterways. They were going to basically create reed beds, which are good habitat for birds, and they were also proposing to create a lake for boating and fishing and, and angling and so on. And they were curious to know what was the best option, particularly because there were two environmental NGOs in the region who disagreed with each other. One NGO was really interested in birds and said, obviously, the best thing you could do is create reed beds, bird habitat. And there was another NGO that said, no, we think the recreation's more important. So you should perhaps forget about the birds and put more emphasis on, on, uh, on the recreational opportunities. And the company is caught between those and the local government and other people to try and figure out, well, what kind of information can economic valuation bring that would help in this, this decision making? Uh, I'm not sure how meaningful this is, but it will give you a sense of the, the area. It's a very relatively small area uh, in a floodplain. Um, the land that they were looking at where they wanted to extend their operations was currently pretty low value agricultural land. A lot of it uh, used for livestock because it's seasonally flooded pasture. Um, not particularly profitable agricultural land, but uh, not zero. Um, and this is a picture of what they were proposing to do in terms of restoration. You can see there's an area where they were uh, suggesting to put a reed bed and another area to put a, a lake. And so what we tried to do in this case was apply 
cost-benefit analysis as the framework and some of these valuation techniques um, with a heavy reliance on benefits transfer because we didn't have the time or resources to go out and collect new data. Fortunately, the UK has been studied quite intensively by environmental economists, and so there, there is a, a rich database that we can use even from the region. We could find values from other studies in North Yorkshire, which we could transfer not very far away to, to this site. <coughs> And we needed a reference scenario as well as a, a project scenario. The reference scenario was no extension, permit denied. Um, just stick with the status quo of intensive agriculture and uh, some flood control that was already in place versus what the company wanted to do, which was take the sand and gravel and then restore it afterwards. And we tried to look at a range of different ecosystem services, biodiversity by which we uh, meant bird habitat, basically, and the existence values of the birds that would uh, uh, be created by uh, re restoring this wetland. Recreational values, flood control, and carbon storage. We thought we'd throw that in as well just to see is there a carbon, a, a climate mitigation benefit from this restoration activity. And uh, as you will know, we, we needed to look at non-market values, so take an, an economic approach as opposed to just the financial flows. Just as an aside here, the company was very reluctant to tell us how much money they were going to make from the querying operations. They didn't really want that to be part of the discussion, but uh, um, if you do include those values, it swamps the whole story because it's a very profitable business, basically. So for biodiversity, we looked at habitat, mainly for birds. We looked at previous willingness to pay surveys that have been conducted uh, not too far away in Northumberland. Um, I'm not sure is that a, a neighboring county of Yorkshire, I should know, but uh, I don't. Um, and I think that was a contingent valuation survey that was done, uh, estimating the value of wetlands on farmland or the wetland creation on farmland at 53 UK pounds per household per year for five years. It's a very precise estimate there that we were able to, um, to adapt. We had to adjust for the population, the distance of the population from the wetlands, um, how many households they are, um, how big is the area that was going to be um, uh, created. So you, you make various uh, adjustments, as you know, when you, you conduct a benefits transfer exercise. Similarly for recreation, we had at previous estimates of willingness to pay of individuals for marginal boating opportunities uh, in the area, um, valued at uh, just under five pounds per resident per year. We had to make some assumptions about how many boaters would be able to use this new lake if it were created um, and how that would change over time. Flood control, uh, we have some estimates, I think, from the UK government of the, the per hectare value of maintaining wetlands for flood protection, 892 pounds per hectare per year, fairly substantial value. And surprisingly, carbon storage came in very low. You don't get a lot of climate mitigation benefit from wetlands in that region. Um, that's not the case in the tropics where you can get some very high values. Depends on the vegetation and what's happening in the soils. We also looked at the cost side of the equation. What are the restoration costs, but also what are the aftercare costs to, to manage these areas over uh, a 50-year uh, uh, contract? Um, and what kind of funding would need to be put in place to manage those, uh, those wetlands for 50 years? And Importantly, we looked at the opportunity costs of foregone agricultural output. And as you'll see, um, very different mixed estimates of, of costs and benefits. On the left side, you've got the benefits. And to my surprise, the um, habitat creation was the biggest single estimate. Again, that is uh, the amount, the willingness to pay of households in that part of the United Kingdom for the creation of wetlands as habitat, mainly for birds. A very precise uh, definition of the benefit in question. Um, recreation, significant, but much less than the biodiversity, the existence values of, of those habitat. Uh, flood storage, measurable. Uh, carbon sequestration, virtually invisible. On the cost side, again, as you would expect, I think um, the opportunity cost was the biggest item. So the loss of agricultural output from converting from um, 
floodplain agriculture to, to wetland conservation. The uh, restoration costs and the management costs of those protected areas, not huge. If you put that together, benefits outweigh costs. Um, I suppose the, the main point here that was of interest to the company is to be able to say uh, that they are delivering value, that it's measurable economic value, it's greater than the costs that they are incurring themselves or that they are imposing on the agricultural producers, um, and that this, although they can't cash in, they can't turn that value into cash flow for the company, they're nevertheless making a positive contribution to the economy of the area in terms of these environmental benefits. Um, so just some, some brief uh, thoughts on what they concluded from this. The values of wetland restoration and creation are significant. The costs are relatively small. Um, as you'd expect, the net benefits are greatest where the uh, opportunity costs are lower. And they were most excited about the possibility to integrate this valuation approach into their existing procedures. Most, like most companies, they have very elaborate procedures for environmental and social impact assessment, ES, ESIA, um, which typically do not include any kind of economic valuation. So they were looking at this as a test case, a pilot to use valuation, build that into their environmental and social impact assessment to um, try and deliver better decisions on how to use uh, restoration resources. Okay, what I've tried to do, and I realize uh, we've still got some time ahead of us, um, briefly wanted to look at what's the business case. Why should business care about biodiversity and ecosystems? What are the drivers of those, uh, of changes in interest? How do we understand the linkages, positive and negative, uh, and dependence between business and biodiversity? Um, and I looked at a, a case study example. What I'm proposing to do next week is to look at the next sequence of chapters in the, the Teeb for Business report, looking at uh, what kind of things can business do to avoid or mitigate biodiversity risks, what are the new business opportunities in biodiversity and ecosystems, um, and then lastly, how do we get, wh what can we expect business to do on their own, on a voluntary basis, and what requires government action to try and tighten up the, uh, the rules that they, they work on? How do we change the incentives? Um, this is a slide you've all seen before. I took the liberty of adding some additional logos. These are the different organizations that contributed to the Teeb for Business report. Um, I will stop there briefly. I, I realize uh, we've got some time still, about 10, 10 15 minutes.